Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our public lecture today. But before we get started, we respectfully acknowledge that SFU Burnaby is located on unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, including the tsleil waututh Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam Nations. And I'm honored to be joining you from Invermere, BC, on the shared unceded home of the Squamish, Kiskanuk, and Tanaha Nation, and the chosen homeland of the Columbia Valley Métis. Since 1989, SFU's Community Economic Development Program, or SFUCED for short, has been a leader in bringing about social, ecological, and economic change. Researchers refer to a set of five principles that help differentiate CED from other traditional forms of economic development. And our 120 hour program is focused on developing students' understanding and practices to support them in their community. And since 2023, SFUCD is the only program that offers such a diverse mix of accreditation opportunities. As one completes a professional program, you can gain credits toward your Economic Developer or ECD cert certification with Economic Developers Association of Canada, and we are BC's only EDAC accredited institution. Credit union directors can gain eight continuing education credits with the Canadian Credit Union Association by completing our CED 126 Sustainable Leadership course with Derek Hansen. And CED certificate holders can work toward the Technician Aboriginal Economic Developer or TAID certification, while those with an undergraduate degree and eight years of experience can work towards their Professional Aboriginal Economic Developer or PAID certification with CANDU. In fact, this June, 11 of the 28 CAID graduates from across Canada are recent grads of our program. And finally, our grads will receive credit for three courses and save $5,000 in tuition if they choose to go on to Cape Breton University's MBA and CED program. Collectively, this certificate provides students and our organizations some amazing opportunities that will reverberate well beyond our time together. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce Stephen Dorsey. Stephen is a seasoned executive with more than 18 years of experience in the not-for-profit sector, working to improve the social and economic circumstances of vulnerable populations. He began his career in community economic development at Dixon Hall in Toronto, where he played a key role in building and supporting innovative programming for at-risk students sorry, at-risk residents in the inner city. He relocated to Vancouver in 2014 to lead TradeWorks Training Society, where he guided the growth and revitalization of the agency's critical employment and social enterprise programs. The majority of his experience supporting populations facing barriers to employment, including concurrent disorders and homelessness, come from working in two of Canada's most challenged and impoverished urban communities, Vancouver's downtown east side and Toronto's Regent Park. He has developed delivered and led innovative programming to provide support and solutions to improve the lives of residents with a focus on income generation and grounded in social determinants of health perspective. He serves on a number of community boards, including the advisory board of the Vendors Project and is a mentor to many organizations in the downtown east side. Steve, thanks for joining us today. Great, thanks so much. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a, a pleasure to be here uh, with all of you today to talk a little bit more about community impact real estate uh, and how we leverage commercial real estate to foster local and inclusive economies. Um, certainly a unique project in uh, Vancouver and possibly North America. Uh, and it's, a, it's just a pleasure to be able to share that information with all of you uh, this afternoon. So why Community Impact Real Estate Society? What was the, the genesis or the, the reason for creating this particular uh, initiative? Um, about six or seven years ago, a group of local residents in the downtown east side recognized that there were a number of government-owned capital assets uh, that existed in community that were tenanted to for-profit businesses that could potentially be leveraged differently to create value within the downtown east side specifically. There was a recognition that these assets were, in a sense, economically extractive. Uh, for-profit tenants and businesses were in those spaces. Uh, money went in and then left the community to those larger corporations. Uh, so community, through the leadership of people like David LePage and BiSocial Canada, along with some other advocates, uh, convened a conversation with uh, one of the largest property owners, BC Housing, as well as the City of Vancouver and the Central City Foundation, um, uh, as well as uh, Van City uh, Community Foundation. Uh, the CEOs of those organizations got together with community uh, and recognized that the assets that they held could be deployed more effectively if they were under community control and designed to keep money uh, circulating within the community as opposed to being extractive and pulled out. Uh, so CIRES was created in 2017 as an arm's length, not-for-profit, independent, uh, with the express goal of leveraging commercial real estate 
to accelerate community economic development in underserviced uh, communities or areas with high vacancy rates uh, and low income population. Um, and that's really kind of uh, how we came about. Um, we've been in operation now for almost uh, six years. So enough time to test the model and the theory uh, and um, have, have been going strong ever since. So our purpose, our goal, our mission is to support thriving, equitable and inclusive local economies and communities through the curation of a balanced portfolio of commercial spaces. And I'll come back to what curation means and why that's important in a moment. Uh, our vision is communities where all residents can prosper and live full and rewarding lives. Uh, places, uh, communities with places and spaces for everyone. Um, and our values are certainly based on collaboration, equity, uh, being community advised and long-term sustainability. We achieve our mission, our goals, uh, through the curation of a portfolio that maximizes social and economic benefits. What that really means is um, looking at our tenanting of our spaces and understanding how to bring the proper tenant mix in order to achieve uh, those goals of social and economic benefit. Uh, one of our additional goals is growing and diversifying the amount of commercial space in our portfolio. Um, certainly, we look to lead and support community economic development initiatives in addition to the work that we do. Uh, and then we have some internal goals around striving for operational excellence by being well managed uh, and sustainable long term. So using the, the assets we have um, to ensure that we have long term sustainability in community. Ceres operates under a really unique model. We don't actually currently own any of the real estate that we manage. We enter into a head lease situation with property owners, which essentially makes us a tenant of the of the of the owner, but also a sub landlord. We in turn rent those spaces out or tenant them uh, to our sub tenants. So in a sense, we're an intermediary uh, where we take on the fiscal responsibility for property, including property management and maintenance, tenanting costs, leasing costs, um, the full package. And through that head lease model, have the flexibility to design and curate a portfolio that benefits community. So we have that, that ability to subtenant those spaces uh, to, to other folks. Um, what that looks like currently, um, is we have a head lease in place uh, with BC Housing, with the Provincial Housing Authority uh, that runs right now through 2037. Uh, so about 15, 15 or so years left on our head lease, uh, which has given us access to a significant amount of commercial real estate in Vancouver's downtown peninsula. We in turn sublet those spaces to tenants based on our mission of creating economic and social benefits in community. Uh, so a little bit different way of looking at things. Currently, we have, uh, through the head lease, uh, 53 units of space, or just, uh, just under 115,000 square feet of commercial retail space. I said earlier that we work deliberately to curate or blend our portfolio to make it financially sustainable and viable. Uh, you can see the mix. 45% uh, of our current tenants are considered market tenants. Those are tenants that run for-profit businesses that um, pay market rent, uh, and exist in the portfolio, the rent that they pay offers us the ability uh, to create affordable space for our non-market tenants. Our non-market tenants are social enterprises, uh, not-for-profits, uh, or other small businesses that offer an affordable good or service that might be missing in community. Uh, we use the market rent to cross-subsidize the balance of our space, which allows us to uh, offer it up to $0 base rent um, to our non-market tenants. Um, as you can see, our portfolio as it exists is quite full. We have one vacancy uh, and we have a wait list currently of about 40 organizations that are looking for space. Um, uh, as soon as we get it, we try to turn it over to our to our wait list. Uh, our portfolio is broken up into different categories in a way that serve community. Um, so as you can see, uh, 20 local small businesses. Uh, three of our tenants are focused specifically on poverty reduction, uh, five looking at targeted employment. Those are essentially social enterprises that hire locally from community. 
We have three women serving organizations um, looking at expanding our work around reconciliation and economic inclusion with our indigenous partners. Um, currently, we have two indigenous uh, tenants in the space. Uh, if I move this, uh, we also have a focus on arts and culture. Uh, so we have um, actually a new tenant coming into Gastown. It's a comedy club. We're really excited to get them in in that space. They're a not-for-profit arts organization. Um, and then community assets, which is kind of an interesting way to look at our portfolio. Um, in this case, community assets refers to respite sites or indoor spaces within the downtown east side um, that were created during the COVID experience to give community members a place to get off the street um, and indoors to receive additional supports and services. So again, the key here is the curation of our portfolio and the fact that we, we look at our mix from both a community needs perspective and then through a financial lens to understand how to find the right balance in order to make the portfolio self-sustaining. Uh, we do pay uh, for all of our space to VC housing uh, through the head lease. So we pay an average per square foot rate um, to the housing authority. Uh, and then again, we, we sustain the affordability piece um, through the Delta that exists between uh, what our market tenants pay um, and, and the difference between what we pay to BC Housing, which allows us to, to offer up those spaces at, at a significant, uh, significantly reduced rate. Um, when we tenant our spaces, we do a lot of, um, put a lot of thought into who gets what space and at what rate do they pay. Uh, so I would say on the non-market side of our portfolio, uh, probably 75% of our tenants pay $0 base rent. And uh, I'm sitting in a quiet booth and it's decided that I wasn't uh, being active enough. So if I can get the light back on. Well, it is what it is. We're going to roll with it. <laughs> uh, so as I was saying, um, within our non-market portfolio, roughly 75% of our tenants uh, are paying $0 base rent, uh, which equates to about $1.6 million, $1 million in rent um, abated for our non-market tenants on an annual basis. So the, the economic contribution or, or, or cost savings for our non-market tenants is actually fairly substantial. Um, on the market side, uh, all of our tenants are paying Market rates are just slightly below market um, based on reasoning we'll get into in a second. Uh, the net effect here is that we are able to fully sustain our operations um, entirely based on the rent that we collect from our market tenants. So CIRAS doesn't rely on external government funding. Uh, we don't apply for grants. We don't fundraise. Uh, everything we do is fully sustained uh, by the revenue that we derive from the portfolio itself. Um, so it's kind of a, another, again, a unique way of looking at um, at doing business in the community in a way that is uh, adding value but not taking necessarily from other community-based partners. Great. So I was beginning to talk a little bit about our rent determination. Uh, it's really, really simple when you get right down to it. The higher your social impact, the lower your base rent. Uh, the lower your social impact, the higher your base rent. Uh, so it really is a unique sliding scale, um, and we look at every prospective tenant on an individual basis. Uh, so we consider the value that they bring, uh, what it is that they're offering to our community, uh, and then adjust rent uh, accordingly. All of our tenants, for those in the property uh, industry would understand this, all of our tenants pay operating cost. Uh, those are things like common area maintenance, exterior building maintenance. So that's a common cost. Um, but it's uh, traditionally a small portion of an overall occupancy cost. Uh, so it allows us to bring some equity to all of the other services that we're able to provide. Um, when it comes to tenant selection specifically, it really is based on uh, community need, market opportunities, and maintaining that portfolio balance. Uh, so when we do have a vacancy, we will look at uh, where that vacancy happens to be located and what happens to be missing or needed in that particular neighborhood or block. Um, certainly within the downtown east side, specifically in the Hastings corridor, we're losing a lot of affordable places for folks to shop. Uh, we're losing access to medical services that are not harm reduction based. Uh, and we're losing affordable space for not-for-profits. Um, conversely, if we go to some of our holdings on Granville Street, 
um, less of a community need, more of a market-based opportunity to capture a higher base rent. So we'll look at the location, the community, where the gaps are and try to fill that. Um, we certainly value uh, our community partners and being community informed. So when we do have a vacancy, we have a community-based advisory that helps us better understand what the need might actually be um, that we need to fill. That advisory is made up of uh, not-for-profit partners, a local real estate broker who understands the market that we, in, we operate in. It includes uh, residents with lived experience in the neighborhood that can bring a resident-led uh, insight. Uh, and we do a more in-depth consultation with those folks to determine what's missing and how best to fill that space. Um, we certainly prioritize community benefits. Uh, so again, community need. Um, is the prospective tenant local serving? So do they bring goods or service to the local community? Do they offer low barrier employment opportunities? Do they procure their goods and service locally? Uh, and do they have strong financials? Uh, so a little bit more than a typical broker-led approach would do to tenanting and leasing a space. Um, under the terms of our head lease, every prospective tenant uh, does need to be approved by BC Housing. Uh, and that's for reputational reasons. Um, so we do all of the front end work. Uh, we um, negotiate the lease, we do the financials, we do the due diligence, and then we bring that selection to BC Housing. Um, many of our uh, retail units are located in SROs or in mixed use buildings. So part of our tenant assessment is also to work really closely with the housing operator uh, who shares that space. Uh, we we do a lot of work with the housing operator to say, hey, we have this prospective tenant. How do you feel about that? Is it the right fit for the residents in your building? Um, is that is that good for you? Uh, so it is a comprehensive community based approach to tenanting, which again is a little bit different uh, from a traditional uh, property owner who would just go for, you know, the entity that can bring the the highest rent, has the strongest financials, uh, and and the longest term um, sustainability. One other really unique piece about our leasing um, are our social benefit covenants. Uh, I wanna unpack that a little bit. Uh, so it's not just enough uh, for our tenants to bring added value to community through the work they do or the service they offer. We expect a little bit more. Uh, now with our non-market tenants, the social benefits are obviously um, quite apparent. We have women's legal clinics, we have indigenous legal clinics, we have medical practitioners, we have affordable grocers, uh, goods and services. They're the benefits really easy to quantify. With our market-based tenants though, it does uh, change a little bit. What is the added value that they can bring? And to that end, we work very closely with all of our market-based tenants to understand what it is they can do to enhance their presence in community and bring added value to the residents who live around them. Uh, many of our market-based tenants are in hospitality, and that looks like food security. Uh, so food and meal service to residents. Um, some have committed to hiring targets uh, for low-income um, low folks or folks with barriers to employment, and others have shifted their procurement patterns, their buying patterns to purchase locally. All of those agreements get negotiated during the leasing process and then written into the actual lease uh, as a schedule um, to the lease document itself. So it becomes a legally binding covenant on the tenant um, that is enforceable and measurable. And again, I think it's a different way of doing business. Um, we, we expect more and we uh, have a mechanism to, to hold our tenants accountable to delivering that additional value. Um, most of our uh, for-profit tenants are excited about the prospect, uh, which was a bit surprising when I first joined this organization. And I'll explain how that works in a minute. Um, for some, a social benefit is really tough to quantify. Uh, so as an example, we have um, two tenants on Granville Street in the entertainment district that are nightclubs. Uh, really hard to put a social benefit covenant on that type of an establishment. Um, so they pay full market rent, uh, and we just leverage that revenue to support a range of other initiatives. Um, for our other market tenants, 
that do provide social benefit covenants, we may adjust their base rent slightly in recognition of that contribution. Uh, so it gives them a slight saving on their base rent. We are primarily located in Vancouver's downtown east side, uh, along with, like I say, a couple of locations uh, in Granville Street in the entertainment district. Uh, and then we also have a holy commercial plaza in Hastings Sunrise neighborhood, uh, just to the east of the downtown east side. Um, the majority of our, our locations are in SRO buildings, uh, are in mixed use buildings, so residential above with uh, commercial real estate at grade with the exception of our plaza in Hastings Sunrise, which is strictly a commercial-based plaza. Uh, again, BC Housing is the primary partner in this work, um, and we really pleased to work closely with them on accessing these properties uh, and then deploying them more effectively to create that community um, economic development value. Um, BC Housing, I think, was really excited about this type of work because they recognized that their emphasis is on housing, and it's not so much on being deliberate and thoughtful about their commercial real estate. Uh, and given the high concentration of units in the downtown east side, um, they recognize the value here of, of creating a vehicle that would create increased value for residents in community. So what are, our, what are some of our direct benefits? Um, certainly through a community economic development lens, affordability is, is first and foremost uh, what we can offer. Um, currently in neighborhoods like the downtown east side, we're seeing market base rent uh, on average of 30 plus dollars a square foot, uh, which just blows my mind given the conditions of the neighborhood and the difficulty in operating for-profit business or, or other services. Uh, that is incredibly challenging uh, not just for a business, but even more so for a not-for-profit, a social enterprise, uh, or a locally owned um, mom and pop entrepreneur trying to get a foothold in community. Uh, I, I can't stress that enough. Uh, we have a commercial real estate affordability crisis that's running in parallel with our housing affordability crisis. And gentrification is driving both. So much attention has been placed on the housing portion um, that I think the commercial real estate piece gets lost in the conversation a little bit, uh, but it is a barrier uh, to services and support staying in community. The net effect is that we keep adding affordable housing without all of the other supports, services, stores, shops around it that create whole communities. Uh, and if we continue uh, collectively as a, a government to neglect affordable commercial real estate, we're widening the divide in community between residents um, who will live there because of the, the amount of affordable housing, but increasingly feel disconnected from the place that they live. So the affordability piece for us is, is a major component of, of what we do and the value that we bring. We ensure that um, those social enterprises that provide uh, low barrier employment remain in community close to the constituents they serve that women's organizations that provide counseling and legal support services remain close to the residences where their constituents live, uh, a, a really large piece. We are also committed to our spend to prioritize social enterprise when and wherever possible. Uh, so every dollar that we spend uh, according to our financial policies and procedures, if we can direct that to a social enterprise, that's the first determination in our um, contracting and procurement activities. So for example, for all of our exterior building maintenance, we contract Mission Possible, uh, which is a social enterprise in the downtown east side that does a range of things from uh, light security to building maintenance to landscaping. Um, we do that through our catering operations, uh, even our property management company. Uh, we use Atira Property Management Inc., which is a social enterprise, uh, and we made a, a deliberate choice to switch from McDonald Commercial Realty, which was a for-profit entity, uh, to a social enterprise-based property management company in order to continue to have those dollars circulate in community through our spend directly. Uh, certainly, we do a lot of additional investment in our tenants. So if, aside from just providing affordable space, we leverage some of our surpluses to really take a hard look at what our tenants need to thrive 
uh, and then come alongside them and make direct investment investments in their business or in their space to make that happen. Uh, so for example, uh, if you're a non-market tenant and your flooring is starting to wear out, uh, typically that would be a tenant expense. Um, we're able to kind of look at that and say, yeah, you know what, we're going to make that additional investment for you in the space, whether it's lighting, flooring, uh, it could be something even as interesting as a professional development opportunity. So some of our, our smaller organizations have come and said, look, we want to send one of our managers to this conference. Is this something you would support? Here's the benefit. And we'll, we'll often make that, um, make that investment alongside them. Um, we've also used it to purchase capital assets for our social enterprise partners. Uh, a few years ago, just before COVID, unfortunately, uh, East Van Roasters had the opportunity to participate in the Christmas market um, downtown Vancouver. Uh, but that represented a significant hurdle. As much as the opportunity for them was tremendous from a marketing perspective, uh, reaching new customers and a new audience, the financial cost was um, onerous. Uh, so they came and said, look, we'd really love to do this. We need new espresso machines, a new checkout center uh bar fridges it was about twenty thousand dollars in new equipment we sat with the management of evr and said what do you think your return on this experience will be both in dollars and in, in increased marketing uh, and in the end it looked like they would generate an extra sixty thousand dollars in revenue through that experience plus the increased marketing visibility and we said yeah this is a no-brainer for us we'll buy that equipment for you so that you can capture that market uh, and continue to add employment opportunities and grow your social enterprise. Um, so we do invest heavily in our tenants in order for them to thrive and be successful. Um, another piece of work that we do that I think is unusual or, or maybe not, not as common, we're a partner with the city of Vancouver on a number of um, initiatives. So during COVID, uh, the city deployed numerous washroom trailers into high traffic areas in the downtown east side to increase uh, sanitation, access to washroom facilities and washing stations. Um, because of our financial expertise and acumen and our presence across the community, the city of Vancouver said, would you be our lead contractor on all the maintenance services for the washrooms? <laughs> and I thought, well, we don't do that. We we run real estate, we don't do services. Uh, and the city said, well, we, we value and trust our relationship with you. We understand the strength of your financial back backend. Um, if we contract you to provide the service, you can then subcontract that to social enterprise. Uh, and we have the assurance um, that our money will be well invested and reach our targeted um, audience and provide those services. Um, so we started a, a bit of work with the city of Vancouver where we are a flow through account holder. We essentially take money in trust and then subcontract work to social enterprise. So we've become a partner in ensuring that the city's procurement activities shift um, from for-profit enterprise to not-for-profit social enterprise, uh, which is a significant change in how they manage um, their spend and a unique way to partner with the city of Vancouver around some of this work. Uh, in addition, we do a couple of space-based consulting projects. Uh, one is helping them better understand and implement the city's social infrastructure plan. Uh, and in addition, we work with the planning department on a project called Activate, where we identify property owners that have vacant spaces in the downtown east side, match them with prospective not-for-profit tenants, uh, and when a match is made, we contribute an additional um, $60,000 per space in over and above capital improvements to that space in order to facilitate um, getting them back on the market and populated. Uh, so we work with the city in a variety of ways. Um, that's one I think that's having um, some success in activating vacant spaces in the downtown east side for community-based use. Uh, and then finally, through Sarah's directly, we provide employment and food security for the neighborhood. Um, about two years ago, uh, one of the housing providers in community uh, decided at their board's direction to exit the social enterprise space. They operated the Washington Community Market, which was an affordable grocery store, uh, as well as a few other social enterprises. When we heard that the community market was going to close, we recognized the loss to the neighborhood in terms of affordable food and food security. Um, so we bought the market. 
with the expectation that we would temporarily hold it and then sell it to another not-for-profit or, or give it away to another not-for-profit to own and operate. Um, two years later, I'm proud to say we have grocery aprons and we're running the Washington community market on a full-time basis. Uh, never expected to do that, but the deeper we got into that business uh, and saw the value that it brought to the neighborhood, the more committed we were to seeing it be uh, sustainable and exist and thrive uh, long-term. Um, the downtown east side is a bit of a food desert. Uh, so at Abbott Street, we have a Nestor's supermarket, which is quite expensive. Uh, and then there isn't really another full sale grocery store uh, until you get further east past Strathcona to a no frills. Um, for folks with mobility challenges, um, that's too great of a distance to traverse, which leaves them with limited options in the neighborhood. Um, Sunrise Market is certainly a valuable produce store uh, and a healthy addition to the community, but that's really about it. Um, so for us, taking on the Washington Community Market was about preserving a valued community asset that both provided affordable goods directly to community, but also was committed to creating employment opportunities um, for folks with employment challenges. So we do a social hiring program in the store, uh, and we've been running and growing that significantly over the past two years. Um, just recently, we've added a back-end Shopify site where now we're able to sell wholesale to our not-for-profit community partners to help meet their organizational food needs. So that enhanced revenue stream uh, through online sales has increased our ability to hire locally and employ more people up front in the store itself. So it's certainly an important part of the work we do. Already touched on this a little bit, um, but the other benefit through CIRES is our social benefit covenants. Uh, and again, I just want to emphasize that these are really unique in, uh, as far as we know, in North America. Uh, we don't know anyone else that's putting social benefit covenants on lease documents as a legal requirement uh, with enforceability. Um, certainly, we do that, I would say, half jokingly with love. <laughs> it's a uh, something we do in partnership with our market tenants, but something that we're committed to having them deliver. Um, typically, when we have a new market tenant come into the portfolio, we provide them with an option. You can pay market rent, or we can discount your rent um, if you commit to the provision of social benefit covenants. Um, for many of our tenants, that is an attractive proposition uh, and are really happy to do that. Uh, internally, as part of our staff team, we have a manager of community economic development programs, uh, and she works very closely with each of our tenants to determine what it is that they can offer in terms of additional value, uh, and then helps them deploy that in community, tracks their progress and their results, and then works with them on communicating that back to their stakeholders. We want to help them celebrate the good work that they do in community through their social benefit covenants. Um, so we're certainly committed to helping them tell those stories. Uh, those covenants, like I said, are, are very different depending on the nature of the tenant. Um, certainly with the number of hospitality folks we have, food security is a very uh, popular one. Uh, so we have meal programs that are provided. Um, to date, uh, we've seen 36 local residents hired uh, amongst our 24 market tenants, so more than one per tenant, which I think is a fantastic outcome. Uh, and then, like I said, for those tenants that um, where the social benefit is not immediately apparent, uh, we leverage the revenue that they pay uh, through rent uh, and deploy it differently um, within community to drive value. So what does that look like in reality? What do the social benefits look like in practice? A couple of examples. Um, some of you who are familiar with uh, Gastown in the downtown east side uh, might know De Beppe Restaurant. It's at the corner of Carroll and Cordova, a really nice, well-established Italian restaurant in community. They happen to be located in a uh, women's building. Uh, so it's women who live above, low-income low women in affordable housing. Um, for a long time, there was a disconnect between the residents in that building and the commercial real estate at grade. Uh, when De Beppe uh, became part of the portfolio, we had a conversation about what we could do with them in terms of social benefit covenants. And they were nervous and uncertain and a little bit afraid of what that meant, given that it was a binding agreement. 
Um, but we help them better understand what it is they could do. And in this particular situation, the women who lived in that building were ordering pizza as a social activity about every two weeks uh, from a, a chain pizzeria, Domino's or, or something to that effect. Um, and we had a conversation between the housing operator and the restaurant and the housing operator said the women in the building would love to patronize your establishment, but it's just out of reach from an affordability standpoint. It's it's a space that they feel disconnected from um, and, and they can't participate in it um, due to economic barriers and challenges. We talked to the restaurant and they said, well, what if we did a meal replacement and instead of uh, having pizza come from Domino's, um, we'll supply that meal every two weeks. Uh, we said, that's great. I think it's a, a really nice way to integrate the business into the lives of the residents and vice versa. Um, we got that program up and running and the response from the tenants in the building was overwhelmingly positive, uh, not just because the quality of their meal increased <laughs> exponentially, um, but they finally felt like they were part of that community, that there was an integration between the commercial real estate and the residents who lived in that building. Uh, was interesting. We were talking to the staff there a few weeks ago, and one of their chefs said the highlight of his working week is when the women come downstairs to get the food. And he said, you know, up until then, he had no idea who the residents were that lived in that building. He had no idea about their life, their circumstances. And now he's got um, new relationships with the people in his community, uh, and he's able to better understand their needs. They're better able to understand the business. And there's a degree of social integration and cohesion that happens in that particular experience. And it's just so great to hear, you know, the staff talk about the benefit that they get from serving that food, the relationships that they establish. That particular piece of work has gone so well that the owner came to us and said, hey, we recognize that down the block is the downtown Eastside Women's Center. Could you help us facilitate meal service to them over and above our social benefit covenants? Uh, because we want to do more in community uh, and we were able to facilitate that. Um, I should add that community impact real estate, we dollar for dollar match every one of these contributions. Um, so if it's a, a $20,000 contribution, uh, it becomes 40 with our matching, matching dollars to really emphasize and grow that. Um, in a similar way, we have a really great cafe, Nelson the Seagull. Uh, cafe and bakery, they make wonderful bread, uh, great, great espresso, Americanos, uh, lots of pastries. Uh, they also are in a building uh, that has uh, women who are the tenants predominantly above them. Very similar process. We spoke to the restaurant, we spoke to the, the housing operator, and the women said something very similar. We would love to go to Nelson the Seagull to buy coffee, uh, but more importantly, to get outside of our rooms, outside of our closed spaces and socialize in community. But we don't feel that's a space for us. We don't feel that we belong there, that, that we're, we're invited into that space, uh, as well as kind of the financial challenge of, of buying coffee in that store. Uh, again, had a great conversation with the owner and he said, I had no idea that the women felt disconnected. We are open to anyone. And he immediately said, what if we offer a voucher program once a week for every resident that allows them to come into the cafe to get coffee, tea, uh, pastry, and a sandwich, whatever their choice. Uh, and we've been running that program quite successfully. Uh, and again, it's created a degree of social cohesion where the women who live in that building uh, can now fully participate in the business that is below them. They're, they're integrated into the fabric of community they're able to find space to grow their social networks, to step out of social isolation. Um, for those of you that know SROs, they're very small rooms. Um, they're very confined. There's not a lot of social space. This brings them into community more effectively and bridges that gap between the commercial real estate at grade and the folks that live in those buildings above them. Uh, so the social benefit covenants, far from just adding affordable goods or an injection of food, it really is about different ways of, of integrating commercial and residential real estate uh, and leveraging that to build community, to build bonds um, between residents and business. One of the interesting side effects of this process is the degree to which the residents start taking ownership over the businesses below them. Um, and what I mean by that um, 
is they feel those places that become important to them and actively protect them from graffiti, vandalism, um, other types of, of social harm. It was really interesting to see that happen. We've known for a long time within the not-for-profit sector that clients typically take ownership over spaces they, that they feel treat them well. But this is the first time where I've seen residents take ownership over for-profit businesses and say, hey, don't spray paint that wall. Don't you know what these people do for the neighborhood? <laughs> and add that extra layer of, of security or support. Um, and again, that's that concept of how do we build uh, an inclusive, equitable neighborhood that functions for all residents through real estate? And, and this is one of the ways that we can really leverage those types of assets to build community more effectively and begin to push back and mitigate some of the social harms of gentrification uh, and shifting landscape in the downtown east side. Um, as I said, uh, Community Impact Real Estate has grown to do more than just manage our portfolio of space. Uh, we do a number of consulting projects with the city of Vancouver. Uh, during COVID, um, we were approached by the province, again, to be a trust partner uh, to create peer work opportunities for residents um, with lived experience in the neighborhood who uh, might have lost their jobs or work or income generation opportunities due to closures and shutdowns of not-for-profit services and spaces. So for example, the street market closed in the downtown east side during COVID because there was fears about transmission of the virus. That meant a number of vendors lost vital um, income um, that supplemented their social assistance and allowed them to meet their daily needs. Uh, thankfully, there was a good conversation between government and community that recognized the impact and harm of that closure. And a really creative conversation happened about what could those vendors do differently in order to continue to make money in, in the wake of the closure of the market. And a lot of that became um, food delivery, uh, frontline, wound care, social distancing, uh, sanitation work. Uh, and we were able to access funds from the provincial government in order to pay those wages. Uh, and then eventually had over 100 residents working um, for two years through COVID doing additional work or different work to sustain them. That program was so efficacious um, that the federal government through the Reaching Home program said, we'd like to pilot this as part of the Reaching Home project. Would you consider doing it in a post-COVID environment, uh, providing that peer work opportunity? Uh, so we're working right now with the federal government through Reaching Home uh, to do a project that hires uh, folks from community through a variety of small startup organizations to do primary wound care in the alleys, to do food delivery, to do sanitation work. So we're we're testing that, uh, and hopefully that will out outlive this pilot and continue to grow through the federal government. Um, another unique uh, thing that we've organized as the Community Coordinated Response Network. So again, this is a, an outcome of COVID, a good outcome. Very early in the COVID experience, a number of our tenants came to us and said, we're very worried about business continuity. Um, what happens if our staff get sick? How do we maintain our contracts as a social enterprise? How do we ensure our business survives? But also, what happens if our customers disappear? Um, and I, I don't think Potluck will mind me saying, but uh, Potluck Catering, one of our tenants, um, provide uh, a, a high number of meals and catering services to the downtown office population. And when offices depopulated and work from home happened, they lost a significant portion of their revenue. And certainly their sustainability as a social enterprise was at risk. So we convened a working group that kind of talked these issues through. How do you redirect your uh, service offering? What other, what other markets exist? Can we look at labor sharing between social enterprises uh, to facilitate continuity of services? Word got out within two weeks that we had had this conversation uh, and the table blew up from eight, eight organizations to over 50. Uh, and we met three times a week through 2020, 2021, uh, and have continued to meet weekly since then. Um, the organization has grown beyond business continuity, um, PPE, um, supplies, you know, some of those COVID related concerns to look at what are the short to um, medium term solutions to the pressing problems in the neighborhood. Uh, so during the encampment, how do we ensure sanitation? How do we ensure security and safety, meal delivery? 
It's a space for a diverse group of stakeholders to meet, share resources, collaborate, um, liaise with government, uh, and really look for community-led solutions to pressing issues while we argue for longer-term systemic change. So it's very action-focused. Uh, we continue to meet and invest heavily in that organization. Um, the Washington Community Market is an entity that I've already spoken about. It's our grocery store. Uh, we've really committed to affordable food um, through the store plus local hiring. And affordability for us means um, going as, as far as taking a box of cereal, breaking it up into individual serving sizes, uh, and then selling it directly to folks who might be unhoused on the street. Um, recently, we've made some investments in that space to include a hot food station. Uh, so that'll be opening soon. Um, so uh, we know a lot of folks that live in the SROs in the neighborhood don't have access to cooking um, uh, kitchens or, or cooking spaces. Plus, we have a high number of unhoused residents. They'll be able to come into the Washington community market, uh, get a hot meal, purchase a hot meal, uh, buy ramen, have hot water, heat it up, uh, and have hot food to go, which we think will be a tremendous additional value to the neighborhood, uh, alongside the fact that we serve um, traditional groceries, uh, household supplies, pet food, all at a, a fairly significant discount. Uh, and then our grants and our non-market tenant investments, I, I've spoken to that as well. So we're heavily um, heavily connected with our tenants and, and invested in supporting them and their future success and sustainability through grants and other types of investments. So where do we go from here? We've been in operation, like I said, since 2017. Uh, we survived our COVID experience, which was uh, very stressful, uh, as it was for many people, but have emerged on the other side, I think, stronger and smarter for that experience. Um, we've grown the portfolio uh, from an initial size of about 40 units to its current state at 53. Um, our budget has gone from a year one budget of 1.2 million to just under 4 million. So we've, we've grown our impact um, in that regard. Uh, so as we look to the future, one of our primary goals is to, to diversify the portfolio. Um, recognizing right now that the initial conversation was with the City of Vancouver, BC Housing, and Van City Community Foundation, BC Housing was first to the table with an offer of space, um, but we want to look beyond the Housing Authority. Um, certainly, we've had lots of conversation with the City of Vancouver as a major landholder in the neighborhood uh, who quite honestly, we feel should be making a contribution to the portfolio and leveraging their space in the same way. Um, we're also talking with not-for-profit housing providers. Um, so often um, when developments get built, there's a focus on the housing component uh, and commercial real estate is part of the rezoning. It's actually uh, in many cases mandatory, but a lot of not-for-profit housing providers don't have experience in the commercial real estate space. So how can we partner through the redevelopment process um, to support that development by, by um, accessing and managing the commercial retail? Uh, we have also uh, signed a memorandum of understanding with Ani Group, uh, and they would be the first private developer to make a contribution to the portfolio. Uh, they have 12,000 square feet of planned light industrial uh, just east of um, the downtown east side. And we are actively in conversations with them about how that can be part of the CIRA's portfolio um, when that development goes forward. In addition, we're looking at acquisition. Um, so we see our long-term sustainability is not just in diversification of the portfolio, but actually beginning to acquire and own assets ourselves so that we build a uh, value over time through the purchase of space. Um, so we're taking a hard look at buildings and units as they become available uh, and have a letter of intent uh, signed already with a developer for a new development uh, to potentially buy up to 10,000 square feet in our first acquisition. Um, I think that gives uh, Ceres a long-term financial sustainability and outlook through ownership. Um, so that's uh, certainly a major goal. Uh, and then something I haven't maybe talked about as much, um, but uh, the work we do is incredibly unique. To our understanding, no one else in North America is leveraging commercial real estate in the manner that we do with the goal to provide the benefits that we provide. And that's captured the attention of other cities and other jurisdictions. Uh, so recently we've met with the city of Seattle, a close neighbor, 
with uh, very similar conditions to Vancouver, um, where they see the value of this type of model working there. Um, much further away, but maybe more practical, uh, is the City of Toronto. Uh, Toronto Community Housing and the City of Toronto are major landlords in that particular city, experiencing similar challenges around real estate affordability, but also community building, uh, and have expressed a strong desire to see how Ceres could expand into uh, that market and, and set up uh, a similar portfolio in the City of Toronto. And quite honestly, the model works, it's been proven. Uh, it could be implemented across the country um, where there's a political will uh, to look at assets differently and, and deploy them differently to create that kind of economic value. And that is a sprint through community impact real estate. Certainly, if you'd like to learn more, welcome to visit our website, communityimpactrealestate.ca. Um, happy to entertain questions, comments through the website, um, and, and obviously now here. So thanks for, for listening to that. And um, hopefully it was beneficial and uh, offered some information and happy to, to answer questions. Thank you so much, Steve. That was a wonderful presentation. Really appreciate uh, the insight and the succinctness of, of it all. Uh, perfect timing. Uh, as I've mentioned in the chat, um, we want to turn it over for, for questions. And uh, sorry, I'm just gonna, you seeing the screen, Steve? Yep. Or right screen. Okay, perfect. So if I look back at the five CD principles, place-based, check. Yep. Yeah. Diverse and inclusive, check. Sustainable, check. Uh, community controlled. Yeah, we got them all. So wonderful. Um, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. And we've got uh, a great comment from local BC. Great presentation, inspiring model. Do tenants pay property taxes in triple net leases? Yes, the short answer is yes, they do as part of a triple net lease. That's part of the operating cost or the common area maintenance. Um, the twist is that because so many of our commercial spaces are in social housing buildings, uh, there's a significant discount on property taxes, sometimes upwards of 50% less um, because it is part of a social housing building. So there is um, a definite cost savings, um, particularly for our market tenants, to being in a Sierra's uh, operated space within a social housing building. Social benefit covenants sound very familiar to community benefits agreements, which some communities that have large civil infrastructure projects underway may have some experience with. How do you measure and compare one type of community benefit against another? And what does social benefit covenant and the regular reporting on that work look like? Yeah, yeah, it's an excellent question. So our social benefit covenants are so finely tuned to a particular business um, that comparing one to the other might be a little bit challenging, although we're starting to look at that um, through buckets of community benefits, whether that's food security uh, or employment or hiring. Um, to, be, to be honest, during the COVID experience, we suspended our community benefit program because of the financial challenges that so many of our hospitality partners were, were dealing with. Uh, many of them were closed for upwards of six to eight months. So we've just in the past six months fully relaunched our community benefit program, our social benefit covenant program, uh, and we're beginning to see the results come in now. Uh, so like I said, we're measuring um, annual hires, how many people have been hired from community. We're at 36 uh, so far this year, uh, but we're also looking at that hospitality and meal service. So I'm gonna have more to present in that regard fairly soon. Uh, we're just collating that data now. Uh, and then we're looking at the value, the dollar value of that spend, and excuse me, what our contribution is likewise to that. You, you mentioned community benefit agreements. And one thing I would like to say is I think that's a future avenue for property inclusion in the portfolio. Um, for a while, I, I did some work with the city of Vancouver on the community benefit agreement policy. And we left a bit of a loophole there around the procurement piece uh, that would allow a developer to make a contribution to a portfolio like Ceres or to community. Uh, and look at the monetization of that contribution over a period of time, and then count that as a credit towards their procurement dollars. Um, so I think there's a way to look at large development on the private side and say, you need to meet certain CBA targets. Uh, a space contribution would help um, get you closer to that goal. Uh, and in turn, it gives additional space to community through a portfolio like Sarah's. So I think those are the type of mechanisms that we can leverage in the future when we look at city policy around CBAs 
Um, and then uh, back east in Toronto, so many of the developers there are highly leveraged um, through financing. And those uh, financial partners have ESG requirements, environmental, social, and governance requirements on their financing. Uh, the environmental piece is easy for a lot of private developers. Doing um, environmentally sound buildings is, is fairly well established, but they have no clue on the social and governance aspect of, about how to meet that. And we fill a really important gap there as a solution um, to their ESG requirements. And we've got a question from Eden in the chat. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Really interesting to listen to. I'm curious if on your website, there's a list of social benefit covenants. Oh, that's a good question. No, we don't have that yet, um, but stay tuned. We're just throwing through a communications review <laughs> with an external consultant. And uh, I think in about four months time, you're gonna see a, a very different presentation of what our social benefit covenants are. Uh, again, we've, as an organization, um, I think flown under the radar a little bit. We haven't done a lot of reporting externally um, with the exception to BC Housing and our, our internal stakeholders. Uh, our goal now that we've come through the COVID experience and kind of managed that is to take a much more public facing uh, position because we think the value of what we do is so great. Um, so excellent question. One that we've noticed is a deficiency in our comms and uh, we'll have rectified in short order. Great. Uh, just as we approach the top of the hour, uh, if you do have some more questions for Steve, feel free to stick on and, and stay on. We will keep this open, but I do want to respect everyone's time and let them get to the next meeting. So this was our sixth of uh, our 2023 SFP CED public lectures. And Steve, thanks so much again for what a wonderful presentation on series. And thanks to the generosity of our presenters like Steve, you can watch all of our previous lectures on our public archives page. I want to put a short plug in here that if you like what you've heard today, we're not going to be teaching community investment real estate yet, but uh, our four to eight month program, fully online certificate uh, for CED practitioners could be your next step in developing, revitalizing or injecting new life into your local economy. And we want you to consider applying for your summer school for CED practitioners, which will start later on this month. And that will allow you to learn where you live and do what you love. So once again, thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day. And again, thank you so much, Steve. And with that, we'll just let everyone leave if they need to.